Connected automated vehicles are moving full speed ahead and we don't want to be left in the dust, right? So we have assembled some professionals who work full time in uh, this type of uh, technology around the country and have some very successful use cases they wanted to share with us today. Uh, Lisa Miller, uh, who was just on one of um, our sessions will moderate this next session. Uh, so since we've already introduced her, um, I'll go ahead and kick it to Lisa. Thank you, Muriel. Great, and I am happy to be introducing the speakers for this next session and moderating. Riley, could you, there, there we go, thank you so much. Great, we have four speakers for you today. Raj Panaluri is the State Connected Vehicle and Arterial Management Engineer at the Florida Department of Transportation. In addition to leading the state's arterial management, wrong way driving and connected vehicle programs, Raj assists with the development of TISMO initiatives. And he has a bachelor's in civil engineering, master of science and master of business administration and a PhD in transportation engineering. He has 22 years of experience in traffic engineering and operations, intelligent transportation systems, and TISMO, public transportation and projects and contract management. And I'm not sure if you guys can um, see my video right now, but I got back from vacation and Raj's new book was in my mailbox at the office. So I can't wait to dig into this. Uh, Raj and Priyanka Alori uh, wrote this book recently. Next slide, please. We heard from Blaine a little bit yesterday. Blaine is an experienced professional engineer with a focus on connected and automated vehicle technology with demonstrated experience deploying these technologies beneficially. Blaine is an active participant and leader in national committees, activities and conferences related to CAV and specifically related to the public sector role in these technologies. We'll also be hearing from Faisal Salim today Salim has served as MCDOT's ITS branch manager, where he has advocated for the advancement of tra traffic operations systems by implementing the latest technologies, including connected vehicle innovations. Faisal has had uh, been influential in the development of numerous regional programs to improve traffic operations. And finally, Kathy McGee. Kathy is currently serving in an active role as the Director of Innovation reporting to the Virginia Secretary of Transportation, Sharon Valentine. In this capacity, Kathy is encouraging the deployment of innovation and technology across the transportation's modal agencies. And her current focus areas include data and analytics, automated Virginia and broadband deployment. With that, I'll turn it over to our first speaker. Please feel free to type your questions into the chat box and we'll kick it off. All right, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Lisa, for the generous introduction. I really appreciate that. Um, I also want to thank Blaine Leonard for his leadership with everything he does with connecting automated vehicles uh, in the country. So I won't take too much time. I'll just spend about five to seven, maybe 10 minutes on the tops uh, presenting on shall we say the Florida DOT's connected and automated vehicle program, but most importantly, bring home the point about what are connected and automated vehicles. So uh, very quickly, I hope you're able to see my slides. There's a reason I didn't go into a slide uh, show mode because sometimes uh, they move all over the screen. So um, what is Florida DOT's program? Florida DOT's program is focused on uh, what is called vital few, safety, mobility, um, shall we say, inspiring innovation and fostering workforce development. And that is what you see. In other words, at the end of the day, all transportation in some shape or form is supposed to improve the safety and mobility experience for all road users, just not the vehicles on the road, but all road users, particularly when we talk about uh, air mobility, the unmanned aerial systems, et cetera. So there's a huge opportunity for us to promote uh, technology as a way to address the challenges that are out there. So briefly speaking, Florida DOT's program is quite extensive as Blaine has been doing an outstanding job in Utah. Kathy has been doing the same thing in uh, Virginia and, and all of us are putting our heads together to bring together the safety and mobility applications. So as you look at this particular uh, slide, there's a total of about 33 initiatives as of last week. 
this program seems to continue to expand. There's a lot of interest in, from all the way from the highest levels of the Department of Transportation leadership uh, down to folks like myself who try to get this done every day. Um, so many of these projects have uh, various strengths. There are projects on data, uh, data aspects. We call it the V2X data exchange platform. V meaning vehicle, two meaning connectivity, and X being other. It could be bicycle, pedestrians, et cetera. There's also the cybersecurity topic that is so important to what we do today with all the data sharing and whatnot, infrastructure capabilities, security credential management system platform, et cetera. Um, I'm just going to give you a brief idea on what these projects look like and what they mean to the transportation system at large. So we started with what are called SPAT projects. When, we, when I say SPAT, I'm referring to uh, signal phase and timing is really what it stands for, signal phase and timing. Um, so signal phase and timing is all about uh, ensuring that the drivers get to know about how much green time is left, the speed at which they should be moving so that they can navigate through the intersections efficiently. And then the same technology can be used to get the information out to bicyclists and pedestrians so that they know about vehicle arrivals and things like that. So SPAT projects offer us great opportunities, but even more important, when you expand these projects at scale and bring both freeways and arterial systems, you can develop what are called ICM, integrated corridor management. In other words, you're integrating both freeways and arterials with traffic signals, your cameras, the fiber optic network, and things of that type. All of these have the opportunity to provide not only a multimodalism base, multimodalism base, not just for vehicles and transit and freight, but also ways to make sure, making sure that the buses, meaning the autonomous vehicles and then the uh, transit vehicles go through intersections um, at a certain speed so that the reliability can be increased. There's also an opportunity to provide timing adjustments at signals so that the freight, the commercial vehicles can move at a, at a certain pace uh, to get to their destinations. Um, also in the event of incidents on projects like the one I showed, on projects like the one I'm showing here, there's opportunities for emergency vehicle preemption. There's an opportunity for uh, interconnecting freeways and arterials so that you can automatically change the signal timing and whatnot. So there's, there's numerous things we can do with technology today, but the question really is why should we take connected vehicle technologies? The answer is simple. If there's a way we can get information to the motorists and to the bicyclists and pedestrians and others so that they can in turn start making decisions on when to cross the road or passively detecting pedestrians, et cetera, that gives us a chance to improve safety and mobility. So here, here are two particular examples that you may find interesting. On the left-hand side of this left-hand side of this slide, you see what is called an NMIS uh, project. NMIS stands for Near Miss Identification uh, Safety System. And what that means is you can proactively figure out where the problem areas are. I'll give you an example. Let us say when we're heading to work every morning, somewhere around 7.30 a.m., there's a lot of harsh braking. A lot of vehicles are harsh braking, the emergency braking, let's say in the vicinity of a signalized intersection. And if you can start mapping that data over a period of time, and we see a pattern, and let us say it's happening in the northbound, on the northbound approach at intersection A, B, a, a, a or whatever, X, Y, Z intersection, then we can always try and figure out the reasons why the harsh braking is taking place. Is it signal timing issue? Is it a turn, turning radius issue? Is it that there's not, not adequate amount of time for vehicles to go through the intersection? So there could be any number of factors at play which contribute to these crashes. So it is important to know why these patterns are happening. So we use data analytics as a way to figure it out. On the right-hand side, you see what is called a smart work zone project. If anything, today, work zones are what we call the low-hanging fruit, because often we think about vehicles and bicyclists and pedestrians, but let's remember there's people who are actually working in the work zones for a living. And these workers, while they're working, are particularly at the risk of getting hit, and unfortunately, sometimes losing their lives. So if there is a way we can create vehicle intrusion alarm type of system, so when a vehicle is driving on the roadway and then it hits a barricade or a cone, immediately an alarm gets pushed out. So anyway, to cut the long story short, there are technologies out there, these connected arrow boards, in other words, provide information well in advance of uh, active work zones and whatnot. So uh, many state DOTs, including 
in Utah's, Virginia's, and Florida, we're all putting our heads together on what are called smart work zone projects. And then, as I said earlier, in addition to the V2X data exchange uh, project, for instance, which brings data from all the roadside units. Roadside units are devices which actually take the information from your traffic signals and from your IP, intelligent transportation systems. Uh, they take the information and push it on what is called the 5.9 gigahertz spectrum allocated by the uh, Federal Communication Commission um, on what is called uh, CV2X, cellular vehicle to other communication. Um, what used to be predominantly the DSRC, dedicated short-range communication, we still have the DSRC out there. But anyway, the point is bringing the data from disparate sources, including your ITS systems, your advanced traffic management systems, et cetera, uh, bringing them together, uh, performing analytics and sharing the data with vehicles, the Fords of the world, the Hyundai's, the Hondas, if they can put all that information in their vehicles, then we don't need all those dynamic message signs out there, right? So there's a lot of things we can do eventually. Security is by far one of the most important things we are all trying to tackle today. Um, so Florida DOT, like many other agencies, we want to ensure that we do the right kind of research through what is called the I Street program with the University of Florida. It's a $10 million initiative, but more than the money part, how do we get to applications oriented research with connected automated vehicle technologies? And also we need to partner with local agencies. One of the things, one of the things which many folks do not probably know is that the local entities, your own local municipalities, your cities, they are so crucial, uh, so important to getting these technologies in place so that we can get the safety and mobility outcomes for all road users, including bicyclists and pedestrians. With that, I'm going to um, stop my presentation. Just a safety message for all of you. Um, we try to do this uh, on all of our presentations. Um, if there's an incident in which you are involved or if you see someone who's involved, um, stay at the scene, help them um, until help is available to them. So with that, um, Muriel, I turn it back to you. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Raj. There really is a rapid pace here and there's certainly a lot, a lot of things going on. I'll turn it over to Blaine now for his presentation. Great, thank you, Lisa. Um, thank you, Raj, for that fascinating presentation as usual. Uh, you have so many good things going on in Florida uh, that we can all benefit from. Um, I'm delighted today to be part of this panel um, with Raj and Faisal and Kathy, um, three great colleagues who are doing fascinating work um, in each of their locations. And um, we share a lot with each other and learn from each other. And that's uh, uh, really the key here. Um, just want to make sure, Lisa, you can see my slides. Yep, you're looking great, Blaine. Go ahead and try and advance really quick. Okay, you're great. Okay, thank you. Um, so as you all know, today's session is about um, uh, use, um, use cases, explaining the things we're doing in each of our locations to advance connected automated vehicle technologies in uh, our states. Um, and um, UDOT's goal in doing this is primarily safety and traveler efficiency. And so that's what we're, that's why we're doing all of this. I'll walk through um, our connected vehicle program and what we've deployed, where we've deployed it and why we've deployed it, getting to the use cases, and then uh, talk about um, automated vehicles as well and mention a use case that we embarked upon. So I'll start with connected vehicle deployments. Um, we recognized early on back in 2014, 2015, when we started contemplating and beginning to deploy um, connected vehicle technology, um, that one of the early use cases that made a lot of sense um, was um, transit signal priority, um, allowing buses that are behind schedule to get a little extra green time on the front end or back end of the green cycle to help them get back on track. And so that's where we started. And I will note here that, that in 2015, when we started deploying, we were learning from the deployments that Faisal had already done in the Phoenix area. And we learned a lot from what he had done, actually started with some of the software they had developed as we began to deploy. Um, so that's where we started. That was the use case that we figured was the easiest to do, partially because we could start at a small scale 
and demonstrate value on that small scale. And partially because we had control of a fleet, we partnered with the Utah Transit Authority. So we had fleet vehicles that we could equip. In 2017, we completed our operational deployment of this system on Redwood Road and Arterial in Salt Lake County, um, and subsequently demonstrated that it actually uh, improved bus performance uh, on that corridor. Um, we, we moved on the following year to deploy this on a bus rapid transit line in Provo and Orem uh, to the south of the Salt Lake Valley. And then in 2019, I've deployed a number of other corridors, the ones shown here with blue dots, those are the actual location of these um, DSRC devices uh, to provide preemption for snow plows when they're actually plowing snow. Um, this deployment um, included total uh, 131 roadside units, DSRC roadside units, and 86 buses and plows. In 2019, we entered into a, a contractual arrangement, a partnership with Panasonic of North America um, to expand our deployments of connected vehicle technology and to build on some new use cases. Specifically, we wanted to connect into the vehicle CAN bus to start getting insights about what's going on in our roadways. The vehicle can tell us a lot about weather conditions and potential crash scenarios. Has the airbag been deployed? Or is hard braking occurring? Um, are the flashers on? Those kinds of things in these vehicles. And, and so we started deploying there and our first deployment in 2019 um, was on Interstate 80 in Parley's Canyon, east of Salt Lake City. We then moved on and deployed in, in Big Cottonwood Canyon, a canyon that goes up to a couple of key ski resorts outside of the city, and in the Park City area, specifically um, to be able to, uh, to warn drivers of curves as they approach curves where they might be going too fast and weather conditions on the roads. Uh, we also were gathering all of that data into a central database for and a cloud-based database for analytics. So in this part of the deployment, we added another 69 roadside units. These are dual mode units uh, that can operate in both CV2X and DSRC mode and 35 vehicles. We're currently in a, an expansion of that project um, to, to expand transit signal priority more broadly, uh, snowplow preemption more broadly, and these other vehicle insights in more locations. And, um, and this summer, fall, and into next spring, we will deploy another 138 dual mode roadside units in the areas shown here with the green dots and another 150 vehicles. Um, we're expanding to emergency vehicles as well here. So we'll have buses, snowplows, emergency vehicles. We're excited about this concentrated urban deployment in the city of Orem. You can see sort of towards the bottom of the map where we'll essentially put a roadside unit at nearly every signalized intersection in that city, uh, UDOT owned and city owned intersections to really be able to gather data on performance of the system and these vehicles um, in a concentrated way. Heretofore, we haven't had enough vehicles to really get a dense set of data in any particular location to be able to really apply some metrics. So we're excited about that. And as we move forward with this program, will continue to expand in 2023 and 2024 in some other areas of the state, including some urban areas, um, and add some applications for, for instance, things like runoff the road and variable speed limit applications, uh, safety applications at intersections, and asset management. We're still working through um, the process here of exactly what we'll deploy, but these are the locations we mentioned. Um, really want to get this out to a sort of a broad demographic and a broad number of vehicles and locations. And I'll add another 100 or so roadside units and almost 300 vehicles uh, to our list. And we have some other deployments that aren't part of this project that will also add some transit signal priority um, north of Salt Lake City and in the Salt Lake City area uh, that will go beyond these numbers. So we're continuing to, to deploy connected vehicle applications our first application was transit signal priority. We found that to be beneficial. So that continues to be one of the foundational elements as we expand. Let me move on to automated vehicles for just a minute. Um, in 2019 and 2020, UDOT deployed um, in conjunction with the Utah Transit Authority, an, an electric low speed automated vehicle shuttle uh, manufactured by Easy Mile in eight locations around Utah. 
Um, we picked these sites specifically so we could have a broad variety of demographics, uh, physical demographics, access um, a transit in a bunch of different ways, and to access a broad variety of individuals within the state. Over the course of this 15 month project, um, we safely transported over 6,800 riders. But we wanted to explore the use of this particular technology, you know, level four automated vehicle as a first mile, last mile solution. Um, Raj mentioned first mile, last mile. Um, that's one of the, uh, we think low hanging use cases for this kind of technology as part of a transit network. We wanted to look at the operational constraints of these vehicles. What does it take to run them and operate them, store them and charge them and maintain them? And how well do they interact with signals? Can we, can we successfully do the vehicle to infrastructure connection with DSRC or CV2X uh, as part of those deployments? As we interacted with the public and got them to write this, our purpose there was to have a broad discussion with them. Um, on Lisa's panel prior to this with with all of the outreach folks um, just before our session, we talked a lot about, and other sessions earlier have talked a lot about, the need to interact with the public, to inform them, educate them, and give them the experience. And so that was part of what we were trying to accomplish here. Um, we found that, that um, this low-speed shuttle can complement fixed transit service that it can become a first mile, last mile solution to get people to and from transit, to and from some sort of a concentrated development, be that a university campus, an office park, a shopping center complex, a hospital, whatever that might be. Uh, we found that that's workable. And, and our analysis or UTA's analysis demonstrated that it was cost effective, even with um, a safety driver, a backup operator in the vehicle, which we had at all times. We found that there needed to be some operational improvements in the vehicle, um, that, it, that there are some reliability issues that need to be improved and some other things, um, but, but all of that can be developed. So that all makes some sense. Um, the LIDAR systems that this particular vehicle used were a little oversensitive to rain and snow. Um, the vehicle needs a little more flexibility and be able to automatically work around obstacles uh, we did discover that it can effectively interact with the signals over DSRC, and so that was a positive outcome. Um, there are some limitations in its operational capability, length of, of the route based on its low speed, and, and we concluded that it would be best operated in, in uh, dedicated lanes or something with, with reduced conflicting pedestrian and vehicle traffic. We had some troubles there. Um, you can see a website address at the bottom for this shuttle project if you'd like more information about the project. We also, as we interacted with the public, um, um, explored the trust of the rider in vehicle automation. As you know, um, most of the public says they're not interested in riding an automated vehicle. They don't feel safe. 98% of the riders that, that took our survey after riding said that they felt safe in this vehicle. Uh, many of them said that they would be willing to use this as a connection to transit. We discovered that the more experience they had, the more positive experience they had with riding the shuttle, uh, the higher their uh, safety margin felt for them. We also discovered that the, uh, that the backup operator, and this applies to any operator of a transit system, has roles beyond just operating the vehicle. Um, we did an interesting study here where we looked at and I think Lisa mentioned this in the last session, um, people's trust of the vehicle with and without a backup operator. And in some conditions, um, with, with half of our 100 samples, um, we had an operator, Nate described, uh, this, um, dressed in branded uh, costume there in the tan shirt on the right. And in half of the cases, he was disguised as a student riding the shuttle along with everybody else. And um, the, those who rode with him in disguise did not know he was an operator, did not suspect he was an operator. They felt comfortable without an operator on board. Um, there, there were some downsides of not being able to ask questions and not being able to get some information they wanted. So there's some room here for, for moving forward. But the crux of this study demonstrated that people can still be comfortable in automation um, when it's operated properly, even without a human operator on board. Uh, we thought that was important and um, 
and really a sort of a groundbreaking conclusion. So those are the uh, use cases that we've explored here in Utah. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to discuss those and look forward to a Q&A later in the session. Thank you, Lisa. Excellent. Thank you, Blaine. And I love your background. That was the deployment up at Station Park in Farmington. It is. Very cool. I'm hearing some common goals across all of the presentations today and yesterday. Safety, efficiency, really across all of these deployments and focus areas. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Faisal for the next presentation. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Can you see my slides? Yes, they're not in presentation mode yet, Faisal. Okay, okay. I will just say go take them here. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, Blaine, thank you for uh, inviting us to this uh, really, I, I was there in the sessions yesterday. So this has been really a very good um, conference so far. And um, I do thank uh, Raj and uh, you and, um, and Kathy, you know, for, for all the leadership that uh, you provide nationally. And I think you did the hard part. I mean, we, we were doing some research and uh, you did the hard part in taking the research and turning it into a, actual operation for the transit vehicle. That's a really tough part. So, so, so really we are proud of it. And now we are switching into operations. So we'll come back to you and learn from you. And I think that's the whole value of this community that uh, we exchange uh, information, learn from each other and uh, bring that benefit to our agencies. So thank you for, again, for uh, having me. Uh, in Arizona, in the space of connected vehicles, uh, we have been engaged in connected vehicles since uh, the inception of the program. Uh, when USDOT launched the vehicle infrastructure integration. And uh, over the years, as uh, Blaine said, uh, we have been working in uh, testing, developing and deploying the technologies in three use cases. Um, the first use case is a multimodal intelligent traffic signal system that focuses on giving intelligent priority to fleet vehicles, including transit vehicles, freight vehicles, and um, as well as emergency response vehicles. Actually, we started uh, with emergency response vehicles. Uh, that was our initial application. And uh, we built a test bed in uh, north of Phoenix area. It's a 10 mile test bed where we have uh, deployed um, uh, connected vehicle technology on 11 intersections, and we have um, vehicles, um, McDots fleet vehicles and other equipped vehicles to test and um, evaluate the connected vehicle technology. Uh, the other application that we have focused on is a pedestrian crosswalk application. And the third use case that uh, we have worked since 2017 is the freight focused uh, work zone application. We got a grant from Federal Motor Carrier and through the C Vision program, which is the Commercial Vehicle Information Systems and Network program, they have changed the name. And through that grant, uh, we developed uh, connected vehicle applications uh, focused on work zone. Our program is led by Arizona Department of Transportation, University of Arizona, and Maricopa County DOT. So I will be focusing more on the work zone use case uh, today and uh, why this use case is important. As you can see on the top left, um, we, uh, this is uh, just from 2019, we had uh, 762 fatal crashes uh, related uh, to the work zones and more than 840 people, um, unfortunately, there were fatalities. And, uh, and it hit home that this year I lost a colleague uh, and uh, also ADOT uh, had a loss last year. So this is a really a serious issue. And, uh, and when, you, when we talk of work zones, uh, unfortunately, most of the fatal crashes involve uh, freight trucks. So, so freight truck uh, safety is really important. So our vision is to increase the work zone safety and mobility. And um, we want to achieve uh, this through the first, these goals, which are listed here. The first goal is to provide uh, better quality and accurate and consistent information to the travelers. 
Second goal is to advance the work zone situational awareness, both for the workers as well as the vehicles. And the third goal is to advance the digitalization of the work zone infrastructure information so that it can support the connected and automated vehicles. And last is uh, to work in collaboration, like I said, you know, with, with our public agency partners, industry partners, so that uh, what we do is not in isolation, but, but something that can have value nationally. So this is the slide I took from uh, CAT Coalition, which is one of the great coalitions that we have nationally that uh, has been uh, doing a lot of great work in uh, connected vehicle space, connected and automated vehicle space. So they have a group uh, which focuses on reduced speed zone warnings. And one of the work they have done is in the space of work zones. So just to explain this use case a little bit better, I thought I'll, I'll uh, use their slide. So not every information that is shared at work zones is, is same. The data is different and uh, it is uh, at three levels. So on the top, you see the travel information level which uh, is a high level information. For example, it can be provided pre-trip or when the vehicle is a few miles away from the actual work zone location, it can provide uh, information such as uh, work zone ahead. It can provide some guidance on alternate route, travel time through work zones. So this is a, this is a low fidelity information. Uh, and um, latency is not a big issue I mean, if it is uh, late by, you know, if it is like a cell phone type of latency or even later, that, that works for this level of information. Uh, the next level of information is uh, provided uh, just when uh, the vehicle is uh, in the near vicinity of the work zone and it provides uh, information like uh, work zone right lane is closed. And as, as it approaches a work zone, it, it provided additional guidance uh, to the vehicle. So this is a driver information level. The last level is of interest uh, uh, to us because uh, this is where we, we are focusing on safety and uh, driver warning levels. And, uh, and this is where we, uh, we bring the connected vehicle technology, the low latency 5.9 gigahertz you have been hearing about a lot since yesterday, um, that type of technology and also provide a high fidelity information. For example, as you can see that now, this is a very detailed map information that we have to provide, so, such as uh, information on what are the approach lanes, what are the work zone lanes, and then we have to identify some kind of uh, nodes uh, which provides more uh, like a la longitude, latitude type of information. Um, the, the other information that is uh, critical in this space is uh, the taper information for work zone, where it starts, where it ends. Then information like um, uh, speed information, information like wor worker presence information. So there's a whole lot of uh, detailed information that goes at the driver warning level. And all this information is provided by us because we, we plan, design, implement work zones. So this is uh, something that we have to provide So this is an architecture from our implementation. Um, as, as, uh, as I said before, we were focused on freight vehicles. So we equipped um, with onboard units. This is the equipped vehicle that um, uh, we partnered with Swift Transportation. And uh, we demonstrated all three levels of information. So the, for the first level, uh, where the truck is right now, assume that it is a few miles away from the work zone, that's uh, where we had to build this backhaul. So you see that, um, that architecture at the bottom where we're sending the, the high level work zone information through our uh, regional archive data system. We have a regional uh, system where we, we curate the information and uh, we turn it into a national standard that USDOT has just developed. It's called work zone data exchange, which is really exciting because they want um, everybody in the country using the same specification. 
And um, some of um, our agencies are our pilot sites. Uh, I think all four of us maybe have our pilot sites for this uh, specification. So we used uh, that, uh, that specification and partnered with a third party called DriveWise. DriveWise have a um, uh, contract with the uh, freight providers and they support their uh, electronic logging system to leverage that. And that's how we provided uh, the traveler information. In, in other words, we provided uh, work zone ahead and, um, and then travel time through the work zone. So at that same time, we're doing the smarter work zone project. So we had more detailed information that we can provide. Um, the second goal was uh, to implement the connect, connected vehicle roadside unit. So we leverage our smart, uh, smarter work zone project because one of the challenges in uh, work zones are, are that they're middle of nowhere. So, so we have to use the, the equipment for power, for, um, for mounting the roadside unit. So those are some of the challenges that we face. Here we leverage a, a message called roadside safety message, uh, which is uh, developed by the connected vehicle community. And this message provides all those details that I was talking about, like uh, map mapping for the approach lanes, uh, the speed information. So this is uh, broadcasted when the vehicle is uh, in the vicinity of the work zone. So the connected vehicle, uh, as you may have heard, that um, the range is up to one kilometer. So, so in that, uh, in that space, uh, it provides uh, the driver warning level of information. So we successfully demonstrated that as well. And, um, and I think uh, we learned a lot from this project. For example, um, as I said, one of the challenges was uh, to not only to mount and power the roadside unit, but, but, uh, but in this instance, uh, we had to develop our own enclosure for the roadside unit. So because there was no enclosure available uh, out in the work zone and uh, we leveraged some of the controller from the traffic signals and uh, that's where we house the processor. We had to drop down the power to the level of what is needed for uh, the roadside unit. And as you can see, this is what uh, we developed and used. So, so connected vehicle technology, I take Blaine's quote, um, it is hard, it's not easy. But here it is, you know, this is a, just a, our demonstration. This is a, through the in-vehicle electronic logging device um, of the Swift truck. And uh, here's the work zone information that we demonstrated. Uh, but I think uh, this was just a demonstration project. As we see in the future, the work zone data exchange is really a complicated supply chain. It has info generators within our own agencies. So we have to work across with the, our construction group. There are people who, who contractors who develop traffic control plans. If you're putting a smarter work zone, so there are some vendors who are expert in that. And then we have uh, our traffic management centers who provide information. Then that's all this data has to be curated into a standard that we see the RAT system there. And then it is uh, broadcasted. And then on the information side, on the vehicle side, they have their own applications. So when um, the OEMs take um, our map information and other information, they, they use it um, uh, for giving the warnings. So they, they process uh, at, their end, at their end. And so I think uh, the collaboration is really important to understand their needs, they understand uh, you know, our capabilities, and uh, so I think uh, it's really important uh, to look at the whole supply chain. So I'll, I'll, I'll end my presentation with that slide. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Faisal. Uh, that's 762 fatalities. That is just unacceptable and we can do better. And I think transportation technology is really one of the keys to being able to do that. Kathy, and, uh, you... Yeah, sorry, so just to just to maybe I spoke, Mrs. Spoke, but 72, 762 were fatal crashes and actual fatalities were 842. Everyone counts. That's true. Zero fatalities is our is our goal here in Utah. Okay, Kathy, are you with us? And has the tornado passed you by? I am here. Uh, we are still under a tornado warning, but fingers crossed I get through this um, without uh, having to run for cover. So everyone think good thoughts. 
uh, and hopefully my connection will stay uh, stay good as well. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Great, great. So the the advantage of being the last speaker in a, in a session like this is that I can say ditto and we can move on to Q&A. Um, it's, it's, uh, I want to thank, uh, thank Blaine for the invitation to be a part of this session. It, it's really great to hear um, what my peers are doing and, and to realize that, um, you know, we're all walking the same walk here. And, and I think uh, the work that we're all doing collectively is, is moving us forward in a really great way. Um, so I am Kathy McGee from the Virginia Department of Transportation. I'm the Director of Research and Innovation. Um, and during um, the current administration here in Virginia, I've also had the opportunity to be the Director of Innovation um, for Secretary Valentine, as you mentioned in my intro. Um, I, uh, I, I think that's a really great role uh, uh, opportunity uh, for me in particular, because it's given me the, the chance to uh, to really encourage innovation across all of our modal agencies. And, and when you think about something like uh, automation, um, it really does span a number of modal agencies. And, and so it's been a, a great opportunity. Uh, in Virginia, we've been working in the connected and automated vehicle space uh, along with, with my, my peers across the country uh, for a long time. Feels like a really long time some days. Um, and, and we've taken on a number of initiatives to, to really try to figure out what it means um, for Virginia, for VDOT, for our transit organizations, um, and, and how we should position ourselves going forward. So we started with a test bed, like so many of our, our, our peer states. Um, we do have a, a connected vehicle, automated vehicle test bed in Northern Virginia. Um, if any of you have been to Northern Virginia, uh, you'll recognize that um, that's a challenging environment. Um, lots of traffic, lots of different modes interacting, high level of pedestrian activity, just a lot going on. Express lanes, general purpose lanes, uh, um, transit running down the median. Um, so lots of lots of really uh, interesting scenarios in which to to look at uh, the impact of connected and automated vehicles. But we've really tried hard um, to um, to stay in our lane, so to speak, and to to focus on um, applications for both connectivity and, and automation um, that will help VDOT uh, achieve its mission um, to, um, to improve mobility and safety for all users of the transportation system here in Virginia. And so the, the um, use cases that I want to highlight today um, will sound very familiar because you've heard a lot about them already in this session, but I think they do indicate that focus on, on VDOT's mission. We certainly want to, at the same time, encourage the industry, encourage testing and development across the board, um, but where VDOT is spending its energy and probably more importantly, its resources really are on those applications that help us move our own mission uh, mission forward. Um, and we're very aware that, that as we go along, there could be both positive and negative uh, implications of the technology. You know, certainly we're, we're hopeful that um, um, safety and mobility are improved as we um, begin to draw down uh, the crashes that occur as a result of driver error, uh, which is most crashes. Um, but at the same time, you know, as a traffic engineer, and I probably say this every time I give one of these talks, but I live in fear of that zero occupant vehicle uh, and what that might do uh, to congestion on the roadways. So it's a balancing act, but we, we definitely um, believe in the potential of the technology and, and you should see that as, as I go through the next few slides. So again, we're, we're focusing on those mission critical applications you won't be surprised that I also am going to talk about work zone safety. Huge, huge issue for state DOTs across the country, uh, for transportation agencies in general, um, as we begin to see uh, more money, hopefully, come towards infrastructure. Um, we're likely to see more and more work zones. And so keeping um, both our own workers as well as um, 
travelers moving through those work zones safe uh, is our, our number one priority. So we have a couple of, of uh, initiatives we've been working on. I should say we, we have those numbers like others have shared about how many crashes occur in, in work zones and, and they're troubling. Uh, and will continue to be troubling. We're, we're seeing about seven work zone crashes every single day on average here in the Commonwealth. And, and again, as, as Lisa said, that's just unacceptable. So we've taken a couple of steps. Um, the first is um, what we call the Work Zone Builder app, uh, which really is uh, what others have, have talked about, the, the turning our, our um, uh, work zone into a, a digital um, reflection uh, that we can then share out to the public so that we can we can provide really detailed real-time information about where lanes are closed where workers are present uh, what we'd like them to do as they approach and travel through the work zone um, so the images you see here are just the mock-ups of, of what we've developed um, and the information um, that we can share um, to vehicles um, you know, it's designed to work in a connected vehicle environment, but it also works with carry-in devices, knowing that um, the number of connected vehicles on the roadways today remains low. Blaine and I have had that conversation, I think, over, over time. Uh, the most frustrating thing about these exciting applications is the limited audience that we have to share them with um, at this stage of the game. So this was designed to work also on a smartphone so that we can provide information to folks through an app uh, and begin to make a difference in that way, um, sort of short-circuiting the, the connectivity piece um, through cellular connections. Um, we also have been working on, um, on a connected, what we're calling a connected smart vest, um, bringing that worker again into the connected environment in a way that they are also visible uh, and, and can be um, both uh, warned themselves of possible intrusions into the uh, into the work zone by a, a distracted driver, as well as um, um, their position can then be shared with drivers as they approach um, approach the work zone. Uh, this is an old uh, older version of the vest uh, here in this image. Uh, it, it looks much more like the standard um, uh, PPE that our workers wear today. Um, we're getting better at the batteries and, and all of that. And so we will um, begin testing this in, in work zones here in Virginia in the very near future. And we're looking uh, very much forward to that um, because worker safety is, uh, again, of utmost importance to us. Uh, we also are looking uh, at the development of an automated truck mounted attenuator. Uh, we see, uh, continue to see unacceptable numbers of crashes into these vehicles. I don't know if anyone else is continually amazed at how these vehicles uh, are struck so often. Uh, I'm not sure how you make them much more visible. Uh, and so we're taking the approach of, of trying really hard to get the driver out of the vehicle. Uh, if it is going to be struck, we would prefer not to have someone in there, in the cab of that vehicle, uh, experiencing um, that that strike. Uh, we are participating in the pool fund study that's happening, but we have this other initiative going on here locally uh, to see what we can do uh, in partnership um, with uh, a company that provides interstate maintenance for us, as well uh, as um, Virginia Tech Transportation Institute, uh, one of our university partners that has been so instrumental in all of the connected and automated vehicle work that we're doing here in Virginia. So we hope to be able to tell you more about that, this as it goes along. We have a prototype. We're working now on generation two uh, and, and really looking forward to being able, again, to test this in work zones here in Virginia very soon. And um, uh, moving a bit now um, to some other applications, uh, we have been partnering with um, with Audi, uh, Qualcomm, uh, American Tower, and again, VTTI, our university partner, um, on a CV to X deployment uh, like uh, 
others who have spoke before me today, you know, we invested heavily in um, DSRC in the early days. Our connected vehicle uh, test bed is DSRC based, uh, but we recognize that that um, given uh, current events, that may not be the path forward. And so we're looking to see how our applications, the applications that are important to us as a DOT, um, translate to other communication modes, uh, such as CVDAC. So we have this partnership. Um, we're looking at, we have been looking at two uh, applications. One is a traffic signal application. Uh, as you know, Audi has uh, traffic signal um, uh, uh, systems in their vehicles now. Uh, they communicate uh, signal status to drivers through a countdown timer um, primarily. Uh, and we have been working with Audi on that for a while now. Um, this provides uh, signal information through that CV to X uh, directly into the vehicle. Uh, we also uh, demonstrated our work zone um, communications uh, under this partnership um, and look forward to working with them more on that so that we understand more fully the pros and cons of CV to X as a communications mode. Um, we also have a, a low speed automated shuttle deployment. Again, this was a partnership between Fairfax County uh, and Dominion Energy uh, who were interested in looking at um, how uh, how an, a low speed automated shuttle could work uh, on a a real transit route. So um, we call ours relay. Relay operated between the um, uh, Dunmore Metro Station and uh, a, a, a community called uh, Mosaic, which is a mixed use development, shopping and dining. Um, and residential uh, and provided that last mile um, service between those two locations. Unfortunately for us, uh, Relay began operating um, during the pandemic, uh, which was problematic, obviously, uh, in terms of ridership. Um, but we were able to learn um, many of the same lessons that, that Blaine described in, in his presentation. Um, we actually, uh, our, our route had relay traveling across a, a fairly wide intersection. Uh, and so we had to implement uh, transit signal priority in order to give the vehicle enough time to transit the intersection, uh, given the low speed of the vehicle. Uh, we did see uh, negative interactions between relay and uh, other vehicles operating uh, along the roadway. Um, they did get impatient with the speed of the vehicle. And so, as Blaine said, you know, a dedicated uh, lane would probably be a, a much better option in, in that kind of a situation. Um, and, and we also saw some um, challenges with the sensors being perhaps a little too sensitive. Uh, to leaves <laughs> blowing across the roadway and other things um, that would initiate that uh, emergency stop uh, and, and were problematic to, to operations. But uh, we're looking forward to further deployments. We actually are uh, talking with Fairfax County about um, the next phase. Uh, and we do think that this is a, uh, an important step uh, on the transit side for, for automation. I'm going to leave it there so that we do have time for questions because um, I've seen a bunch of them pop through the through the chat box and, and I don't want to take all the time. Uh, that what you see on this last slide is just my contact information along with the contact information for Amanda Ham, who is our uh, CAV uh, program manager uh, here at VDOT. Uh, either one of us would be happy to talk more with, with anyone who has questions about what we're doing here in Virginia. And with that, I will stop sharing my screen and we can move to questions. Great, thank you, Kathy. Um, I kind of want one of those connected smart vests, not for when I'm in a work zone, but for when I'm roadside doing collect data collection or something like that. And, you know, we talked a little bit about data standards. I think PPE standards is kind of a way to go as well. So thank you for your presentation. We did lose Raj, he had to hop off to another meeting, but um, we had a couple of questions come up in the chat box. and. 
The first one was specifically for Florida DOT, but I'd like to ask all of our speakers, when it comes to issues obtaining data or metadata from private partners, have you run into any issues there? And would you be able to elaborate, elaborate on any kind of specific procurement language that your agencies have adopted to enable seamless data sharing? And uh, Blaine, maybe we'll start with you. Okay, thanks, Lisa. Um, so I'll emphasize that connected vehicle data is by its nature anonymous already. Um, it doesn't collect any information on the vehicle make, model, VIN, plate, registration, owner, et cetera, et cetera. And so we're collecting a lot of connected vehicle data that is anonymous um, in the platform that we have where we're accumulating all of that data. Um, we've built um, a connection where people can get in and use that data for research and analysis. And if you're interested in accessing that data, let me know, we can get you connected into that. We have a number of users here private entities, uh, universities, and others who are accessing that data. Um, automated vehicle data is interesting. Um, most AV developers are a little hesitant to share that data, and we don't have experience getting that data from automated vehicles, so I'll have to leave that part of the question uh, to others. Thank you, Blaine. Faisal, what about down in Maricopa County? Yeah, I think just like Blaine said, um, uh, we do have uh, automated vehicles uh, here in Maricopa County. And um, I think uh, that there is, in the context of connectivity, there is uh, no data sharing because there is no connectivity yet with them. But they have partnered with, uh, with uh, some of our local agencies in like uh, first responder type of data exchange and information related to that, which has been very helpful actually because the first resp responders need to be engaged in this. Well, what happened when an automated vehicle is a crash? They don't know how to handle it. So they have developed protocols and uh, data exchange in, in that uh, context. Very good point, Faisal. Kathy, what about Virginia? So I, I would say, again, you know, a lot of, a lot of the work that, that we've done on the automated side um, has been through our partner at Virginia Tech. Um, and it, you know, in the early days, there was lots we could do um, in terms of communicating with the vehicle through the vehicle bus. Um, they're locking that down on us now, and so it's much harder uh, to to get that data in terms of, um, you know, even in a research project, how the vehicle reacted to certain conditions. Um, so that part is getting more challenging, I think. Um, overall, though, I, I want to follow up on, on something Blaine said, and perhaps taken in a slightly different direction, you know, I think every state has, has approached AV testing a little bit differently um, in terms of regulation or laws or requirements for what data has to be shared. Um, more recently, you know, uh, uh, USDOT has weighed in on that as well, and I think, I think that will be helpful in terms of making sure that some minimum data is collected when an event occurs. Um, but in general, in Virginia, we have no requirements. We have no laws about it. Um, and so we don't know what we don't know. <laughs> we don't know where vehicles are challenged in our, um, in our roadway environments. Uh, and I think that really hinders our ability to, to address those challenges from an infrastructure standpoint. If we understood better, um, you know, where the vehicles had problems, um, more specifically, you know, I think in, in very general terms, we hear, you know, we need bright lines, we need consistent sign placement. Um, but if we had more specific information about where a vehicle loses its way, for example, um, I think that could really be beneficial in helping us address those issues on the infrastructure side. So I think there is room for a lot better information sharing. Great, thank you. We have so many questions for you guys, but we only have about a minute left, so I'll give you a lightning round challenge. Um, for other agencies that are joining us today, what recommendations do you have to give them to advance these innovative technologies? You talked about the CAT Coalition. Um, Blaine, we'll start with you. Deploy something. Get out there. Get out there and try something. Do it small. 
uh, but there's a learning curve involved. And the sooner you can start the learning curve, even if you make some wrong choices or mistakes up front, deploying is beneficial. I love it. And you have a great track record here, Blaine, in Utah and nationally on uh, guidance and leadership there. Faisal, what about down by you? Collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. That's it. Thank you. Deploy, collaborate, and Kathy, final word? Focus on your mission. Look for applications that really help you advance that mission. Very cool. Uh, we did not have time to get to Rod's question and comments, but I'd encourage everyone to look in the chat box and uh, check that out. Thanks so much to all of our panelists and presenters today. This was really great. I'll turn it back over to Muriel now.